welcome to the Sabbath School Study Hour here at the Granite Bay Hilltop Seventh Adventist Church. It is so good to be with you here this morning. Thank you for spending this time, investing this time in learning more about God. Thank you to the local congregation that's here with us as well. We have a great morning of learning, of diving into the Bible and finding out more about God. We will be concluding our lesson today, our quarterly lesson, which has been in the crucible with Christ. And today's lesson, number 13, is especially beautiful. I'm excited for it. It is entitled, Christ in the Crucible. And so today's lesson is going to be about Jesus in that moment of the crucible in his own life. So I'm excited for that. Before we start, I would like to um, invite you to take advantage of this free offer. It's called The High Cost of the Cross. And if you would like this free offer, you could call the number 866-788-3966, and you could ask for the offer number 156. If you're in the USA, you can also text SH080 to the number 40544, and you would um, receive a digital download, a link to a digital download. Or if you're outside of North America, outside of continental North America, you could go to study.aftv.org slash sh080. Eight, zero, and you could also get a digital download that way. Also, before we start, I would like to invite Sharon and Katie that are going to be sharing with us a beautiful song. Thank you. 
beautiful song. Thank you, ladies, for that praise. Um, this lesson, you know, Sabbath school lesson has been around for a very long time, right? Very long time. We've had lessons about so many different things. And truthfully, if you study uh, faithfully the Sabbath school lesson, I believe it's over a period of 14 years, if I'm not mistaken, or something like that, it's, it's equivalent to a, a, you know, a, a college degree in theology. Every, every few years, I, I believe it's 14, but, you know, so if you study it faithfully, um, you will have the equivalent knowledge, or you should, of a college degree in theology. So there are some of these lessons that they, you know, they come, they go, and, and you study them, and there are others that they stick. You know, for example, I remember this one a few years ago, I think it was two or three years ago, that was on uh, the book of Revelation, and it was beautiful. Right? There was another one, again, I think this one was three years ago, about the book of Hebrews, and it was beautiful. And so there are some of these lessons that you, they stay with you, right? I, um, I'm sure that this, in my life, this lesson right here, uh, this is one of those that will have stuck. Because it's about such a real subject. A, a subject. Some of these topics, you know, they're so abstract. Sometimes you feel like they're more theoretical than than, than things that you can actually apply in your life. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? There is this aspect of knowledge which is abstract and theoretical. But this lesson, when it comes to being in the crucible, being in the middle of the trial, being in the middle of the fire, which one of us can't relate? Which one of us don't understand in one way or another, and perhaps in one degree or another, what it means to be in a crucible. I mean, just looking at the local congregation, I could, by knowing some of you, I can already imagine what some of these crucibles would be, you know? And so I can't even imagine for everyone online the things that, you know, go through your mind when you hear that word crucible, when you hear about that word, the trials or the sufferings or the pains of life, I can't even imagine what that might represent to you. So just learning more about what the Bible has to say about these moments, about the examples that we get in the Bible of people that went through different trials, I mean, that just encourages me. That helps me understand that I'm not alone. And I think that one of the greatest aspects of the Christian journey, of this journey that we're on, is knowing that we are not alone. It's understanding that we do not trail this path by ourselves. Because I'll tell you, the temptation is to think that we are in this by ourselves. Have you ever been tempted to feel that or to think that? Something happens, you lose someone, you lose something, you are, you know, you, you, you're woken up in the middle of the night with a, you know, with a phone call and it's a horrible phone call, perhaps a call from the doctor with a very unfavorable diagnosis. Something happens and you feel completely cut off, completely isolated. Has that happened to you? I know that it's happened to me before. And so when I read in the Bible and I read about people such as Abraham receiving, you know, in one, in one blow, take your son, your only son whom you love, and sacrifice him. You know, when I hear, uh, when I, or when I read about Joseph being sold by his brothers and then being wrongfully accused and then being sent to jail, you know, that, that tells me that my problems, they're not the worst problems out there. You know, when I hear about Isaiah, how Isaiah died, when I read about Peter and how he died, and when, so these examples, these people, they serve as, as a great host of witnesses, right? When you go to Hebrews chapter 12 and you read about that great cloud of witnesses that stand cheering us on because right now it's us. It's our turn. It's our time. That encourages me, friends. That helps me understand that I am not by myself. But... Even better than all of this is when I look at the great leader. When I contemplate the life of Jesus and I come to understand that unlike so many leaders here in this world that just stand off and dictate what you have to feel, what you have to think, what you have to do, where you have to go, but they themselves haven't walked the path. When I understand that in the Bible, the leader that I follow, the God that I worship, he knows perfectly and exactly the things that I go through, my goodness, how comforting that is. And today, that is the topic. That is the subject of today's lesson. Lesson number 13, the last one of this quarter, Christ in the crucible. The memory verse already starts with a bang. 
All right, the memory verse is already, you know, it's, there's no big intro here. It starts already at the worst point. Matthew 27, verse 46, that says, about, And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know, this memory verse here in Matthew, it, um, it keeps record of the suffering of Jesus at his crucifixion. But maybe even more striking is the description that we find, the description of this event that we find in the book of Mark. And you'll remember that the different gospels, they have different nuances, right? They're written to different target audiences, to different people. The book of Matthew, it's written to the Jews. That's why you'll find so many Jewish ceremonies and ceremonialism inside the book of Matthew because that's his target audience. That's why the the, uh, the chronology, right, the, or the genealogy that, that appears of Jesus in Matthew, it goes all the way back to Abraham because in Matthew, right, or Matthew, he's trying to prove that Jesus is the true son of Abraham. And then you go to the Gospel of Luke, right? And Luke is a very complex, very deep gospel. Um, it's very philosophical, right? There's an epilogue, there's an intro, a prologue, right? And the reason is because Luke is writing to the Greeks, that were very fond of philosophy. And that's why Luke writes the way he does, to the people that he does. You'll see that the genealogy in the Gospel of Luke is different than the Gospel of Matthew because in Luke, he goes all the way back to Adam because he didn't really have to prove that Jesus was the true son of Abraham because Abraham was known to the Greeks. He had to prove that Jesus was the true son of man, son of Adam, the first man. Right? So that's what you get in Luke. John. John isn't really written to a target audience that's in a group, an ethnic race, right? Or it, John is written to the first century church. It's the last book of the Bible to be written around the year 90 or 91. It's being written to the church that's being persecuted. They're going through their own crucible. And so John is such a deep, profound, um, soteriological, which means it has a lot to do with the doctrine of salvation and of redemption. It's such a deep book that way. Right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and everything was made through Him. And so that's what you find the different nuances. But the book of Mark, the Gospel of Mark, was written to the Romans. Because the Romans, they loved action, right? They loved, um, they were, I mean, they were a military people, they were full of military campaigns, they conquered and they went and they, right? And so Mark, being written to the Romans, it has, it's, it's very short and concise, it's to the point. And that's why you'll find in the Gospel of Mark, uh, Jesus is always acting. He's always doing things. You'll find words such as, at one moment he went. At once Jesus spoke. He did this immediately. You'll have these kinds of words because that's what Mark is going for, right? And so the description of the crucifixion and the whole narrative of Jesus dying in the book of Mark, it is simply fantastic. It is simply absolutely stri- striking, The biblical description of the crucifixion is simply mystifying. Jesus suffered injustice, torture under illegal tribunes, illegal court scenes. He was beaten. He was spit on. He was struck on the face. He was severely whipped. He was crowned with thorns. He went without food and water. Certainly his legs and his feet were swollen by having to stand up for such a prolonged period of time. Finally, he's taken to Calvary the execution site. He has to walk for miles carrying a a 65-pound bar of wood on his back. On Calvary, completely stripped of his clothing to humiliate him even more, he was an object of mockery, of disdain, of humiliation, of derision, laughter from the crowd that surrounded him. Spikes traversed his, his wrists and his feet. Finally elevated between the firmament and the earth. The suffering of Christ upon the cross, however, was not merely physical. It wasn't even mainly physical. Because he carried upon his shoulders the weight of sin for an entire race. For a world. The tearing separation from the Father caused by sin. Jesus suffered the the despair and the horror of the second death, the death that the devil and his subjects will face. But even then, there is a difference between Christ and the devil, Christ and the lost. There is a difference in the intensity of the second death that both groups undergo. 
Because each person that is lost, each individual that is lost, will suffer the weight of their own sins, their individual personal sins. But Jesus faced the weight of iniquity caused by the sins of a world, of a planet. Men, women, youth, children, all that have ever lived, all that will ever live on this pale blue dot. Friends, do you, do you understand what I'm saying? The sins of everyone, every single sin, all the injustice, all the adul- adulteries, all the murders, all the impurity, all the lust, all the scorn, all the hate, all the impiety, all the trickery, all the mockery, all the abuse, all of everything, the lies, the malevolence, nothing less than all the sins that have ever been committed by billions of human beings. He is our atonement. He is our substitute. And so, friends, what was Jesus doing on the cross, some might ask? He was paying the price for all, giving all for all. And what I want you to remember, and this is something that I repeat in sermons and Sabbath school lessons and classes and Bible studies, and this is something that, you know, you'll get this from the book, The Great Controversy, where it says that heaven emptied itself of its most precious resource in Jesus Christ. No one could ever say that more could have been done. The utmost was done. Nothing else could have been done. The best the most precious of heaven was given, was surrendered in Jesus Christ. Only he could do it, no one else. Now, when it comes to the trials of Christ, I mean, we went, the, the, the memory verse, it goes straight to the, the, you know, the crucifixion. But we know that this began early on. This, the, the crucible that Jesus faced, it happened, it, it begun early on in his life. That's what Sunday's lesson is all, all about. It's, it, it's entitled The Early Days. Now, while we don't have a lot of details about Jesus' childhood, we do have enough to understand that Christ, who was sanctity and holiness made flesh, was the object of ridicule, of discrimination, of bullying, and all sorts of opposition and hostility. Ellen White observes that it was impossible to observe the boy Jesus and not notice that he was different than the others. And that difference was precisely an inexhaustible source of prejudice from others. Because, honestly, humans don't like seeing different. Especially when that difference calls out who we are. And that's who Jesus was. Jesus was different. He was portrayed. He lived differently. The text of Luke chapter 2, verse 7, speaks the truth about his birth that says that there was no place for him. And of course, that is a text that has to do with his birth, but that could certainly be applied for his entire life. Because since his childhood, there was no place for him in the world of men whom he came to rescue. In Mark chapter 3, verse 21, we, re- we find a very desolating description. I want you to try to put yourself in his shoes. Okay, that's the exercise of this morning. Try to place yourself in these situations and in these circumstances. Mark 3.21 says, when his own people heard about this, and it's in the, the, it's in the context of the things that Jesus was doing and that Jesus was saying, right? This is at the beginning of his ministry. And so when his own people, his family, heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said he is out of his mind. His family thought that he was crazy, that he had lost his mind. He was considered insane by his own people. And that didn't begin here in this moment or in this text. Of course, this text describes a later situation in his life, but the hostility followed him since his infancy, and that was present throughout his lifetime. His sinlessness, his holiness, was a constant cause of hostility against him within his own family. The life of Christ, friends, was a constant trial as a result of his holiness as a result of who he was, in contrast with the worldliness of the environment in which he lived. His innocence, his kindness, drew prejudice and disdain from others who could not bear to be around such purity. I ask you a question. Have you ever, maybe you've witnessed something like this before. Have you ever been around a group of children, all right? Young group of children, maybe from five to 10 years old, And there's one of them in the group that is more naive, is more innocent. You know, the 
the child's mind doesn't really jump to jokes or to, you know, as easily as the other children do. And you see that, sure enough, very soon, that child begins to be picked on. Have you ever witnessed something like that before? Because of the innocence, because of the perhaps naivete of that child, they'll be picked on. With Christ, that was compounded. His innocence, his purity, his mind was never in the gutter. And at the same time, Christ knew precisely the thoughts of men. So that combination, it's something that we haven't simply seen before. It's common for the abnormal to indispose itself with the normal, for the unclean with the clean, because it is outside of its comprehension and understanding. And so a question that sometimes I ask myself is, what was the effect of all these things upon Jesus? What was the effect of all the the attitude of of, of disdain, of rejection, especially from those within his inner circle, his, his family, his closer friends? Imagine the extraordinary emotional burden that it must have been on the mind of a developing child, even Christ. I can just imagine and picture Mary, his mother, who must have been one of the only, one of the few, if not the only, human sources of comfort and solace, hugging him in her lap a misunderstood and a harassed child. What must have gone through her mind, especially since she knew who he was? You know, when the Bible says that Mary kept these things in her heart, that wasn't a one-time thing when Jesus was born. Throughout his childhood, I can see Mary keeping the events, keeping the record, keeping the thoughts of what, had, what was going on because she saw it and she knew that he was the Holy Son of God. People with a bare minimum sense of justice are greatly bothered by witnessing the innocent and the defenseless suffer abuse, evil, and bullying. And yet with Jesus, that is what you see happening most of the time. Monday's lesson that moves on the scope of time, despised and rejected of men, and this is based on Isaiah 53, verse 3. And so, friends, if it seems here that, I'm, that it's, this is like a downer lesson, it's because, seriously, when you consider what Jesus went through for you and for me, initially, it's kind of a downer because he, went, he did go down. He went way down. Last week, I mentioned that what we're talking about here is the biggest contrast. We're talking about the biggest bridge in the history of the universe. We're talking about a bridge, about a gap from the white throne of God up in heaven all the way down to the cross of Calvary. That's what we're talking about. That's the dimension of what we're talking about. So Jesus went down. He went way down. The Old Testament prophecies already prophesied this. It spoke about these events. Isaiah 53, verse 3, that says, He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. And he was despised, and we did not esteem him. That was the story of Jesus' life. The suffering of Christ was greatly aggravated by the fact that his plan was being confronted primarily by precisely those whom he came to save. Those of you that are parents, I'm not a parent yet, but I've been on the other side of this that I'm going to describe. Maybe you can also relate to being on that side when you were children. Can you relate to the, to the situation where a parent is trying their best to protect their child, to keep them from harm, any kind of harm, be that physical, emotional, relational harm, and the child is fighting against you all the, every step of the way? Now again, compound that by the infinite, and that's what Christ is going up against. Because every step of, way, of the way, the people that he came to save, they are precisely the ones that are accusing him and aggravating his life and fighting against him. The Gospel of John declares in chapter 1, verse 11, it says, He came to his own, and then what? He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Have you ever, have you ever tried to give someone a present, a gift, and you think that they're going to love it? Or maybe an act of service. You do something for someone, and you think that they're going to love it. And then when you present it, when you gift it to them, when you reveal it to them, either 
it seems like they don't care, or it's like they downright dislike it. How do you feel? It's not a good feeling, is it? What about with God? Providing His best and being treated as the worst. And we have to keep in mind here, friends, that this rejection was systematically directed toward the God of the universe, the creator and the maintainer of all things, the one who became one of us in order to rescue us. I think we kind of lose sight of this sometimes. You know, when we, when we read the, the pages of the New Testament, we read the Gospels, sometimes we have this tendency of oversimplifying Jesus in a way where he becomes too normal. And we kind of forget. I mean, it's there in the back of our mind, but sometimes we kind of misplace the reality that this is God. We're talking about God made flesh. And that's the one that these people are doing these things to, are speaking that way to. I think that sometimes we get a bit too comfortable. (laughs) And I'm not saying that God isn't a personal God. Of course he is. The Bible reveals him as a personal God, a caring God, a comforting God, a God that receives and that protects. But at the same time, the Bible reveals this God as the maker of the universe. He is a ferocious God ferociously protective of his children, but he is still a force, the force of nature, the force of the universe. And I think that sometimes we kind of lose sight of that. This is the God that is here facing all of this. And thank God that it was him because no one else could have withstood this. Who else could have withstood this? You know, sometimes we forget that when it comes to the temptations of Christ, let's take us humans, for example. Let's take us humans, for example. Let's say that there's a scale, a richer scale, all right, of temptation. And we'll go up to like the third level or fourth level, whatever, and we'll fall. And so our point of failure is, you know, perhaps four or five or whatever. And here I'm just trying to quantify. Don't take this to the utmost, you know, literally. But I I just want to make an illustration. We'll go up to like the four, the five, the six of the scale, the richer scale of temptation, and then we'll fall. So we can withstand up to four, five, six, whatever. Did Christ ever fall? So his... His scale of facing these temptations, of facing these aggravations, they're infinite. We, we, we don't even know what that, understand, what, what that means. We can't understand what that means very well. And that's what's going on here. All of us, in one way or another, we have, in one circumstance or another, we have experienced the pain, and, uh, the pain of rejection, the pain of criticism and of mockery. Imagine the effect of such derision, of such ignorance and malice put together upon the holy, the pure, and the sacred. It's very difficult to understand. How must he, how, how must he have felt in the middle of such an alienated and blunt race, incapable of seeing or understanding anything about the holiness and the goodness and the pureness and integrity that stood right there before him, before them? One of, the, one of the deepest slivers of insight into what it meant to be Jesus or what it meant for Jesus to be alive here among us and what he was facing is given to us in the narrative of the Gethsemane. Mark 14, 32 through 42 narrates that moment, that story, in which the metaphor of the chalice, the cup, that defines the agony of Christ is brought up. He's described as the object of satanic attacks. Just look at verse 38. In the Old Testament, the chalice, it's a symbol of the fate of a man. And Mark records the extent of the conflict in an intensely descriptive prose. We find with extreme realism the reason for Jesus' agitation, for what he was going through, in a completely vivid wording. Look at what it says in Mark 14, 33 and 34, where it says that he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. And he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Friends, this is where those who who can speak two languages understand or at least acknowledge the reality of what I'm going to say a little bit better than those that that speak one language. Because when you speak more than one language, you understand that some things can get lost in translation. The impact of a word or, or of a phrase can be lost in translation. 
right? You can even try to translate literally what the words are saying, but you lose the impact of that, right? So those who speak more than, two, more than one language, you, you understand what I'm saying, right? These two terms that are, that are used here for troubled and deeply distressed are extremely, extremely emphatic, extremely intense. The Greek word et the Greek word ekthambestai, it's very particular here in the book of Mark. It's found a few times, and it suggests convulsive terror, a profound consternation. The second word, also a verb, admovev, describes a state of affliction that follows an extreme shock. So the state of a person after experiencing a traumatic incident. You know that feeling after, after the numbing goes away? You know, when you're, you're going through something horrific and that you're just numb, but then a few moments later, it all crashes in? That's the feeling. These two words, they're not used here just, for, you know, just to be used. These are very, very well thought out words for this, this moment right here. The translation of these two terms, it's not easy. Their combined effect and impact is very, very difficult to translate because their use is meant to deliver an impacting shock on the reader. Jesus was in convulsing terror and agitation. Extreme shock. Mark makes it clear that Jesus faced the closing of his via cruxis, the via dolorosa, according to Christian history, conscious of what that meant, conscious of the cost. He knew what was going to happen, and he was already feeling it at this point. The emotional quality of the text, friends, it's considerable. Basically, Jesus is saying, my heart is to the point of bursting, it's at the break point of affliction and sadness. That's what Jesus is trying to say. You see that he even tries to, to he seeks out human, human um, uh, comfort. He tries to seek human companionship in this worst moment of his when he invites his disciples, his best friends. Have you ever been going through something extremely difficult and you needed a friend, someone just to be there to cry on, on their shoulder? Someone, they didn't have to say anything. Have you ever needed someone like that? I know I have. And Jesus sought that out. He sought friends. He sought people that knew him, that, that could be there for him. And those best friends of his, they were asleep. You know, sometimes I wonder, what, what would I have done? Would I have slept? Knowing myself, probably. What about you? A supernatural, supernatural, natural Sleep came upon them that could only be taken away by prayer, earnest prayer. And yet here, Jesus, he's not only praying for himself, he's praying for these men. But you know, there's something greater than sadness involved here. Here, the reader will soon notice something that's exclusive. It's exclusive to the Gospel of Mark. The absence of the strong terminology in Luke, you don't find it there, and it's modified in the Gospel of Matthew. But here, Jesus' cry, his final cry at the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this is also a text that has been completely misunderstood by a great portion, the majority of the Christian community. Here, Jesus isn't out of nowhere, out of the blue, saying, my God, you've abandoned me. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus dies with a psalm on his lips. This is a psalm, a messianic psalm, Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God. And he's bringing back the emotion of the psalmist. It reveals that he expired with a verse on his lips. And that's the shout of spiritual angst of a depth that is simply unknown to us. It's no surprise that most commentators, they don't even try to interpret it. They don't go into it. They're silent regarding its significance. And so, friends, the sufferings of Jesus were not simulated or made up or unreal. It's not by chance that the heresies coming from the Greek philosophy that were invading the Christian uh, religion by the end of the first century, they tried to explain it away with the denial of his divinity. Because according to Greek philosophy and religion, God could not suffer. That's a heresy called docetism. And there's another one called Arianism. 
that denied his complete divinity, saying that he was not completely God. And the question was, can God suffer? Can God suffer? That's the philosophical question that was proposed. But the truth is that he voluntarily went through that pain as a substitute, as an atonement in the place of humanity. That is precisely what Jesus did. And so asking the question, can God suffer, it's similar to asking, can God die? He can volunteer himself. He can open himself to go through that situation, as Jesus did. In John 10, verse 17 through 19, we find, Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my own life, that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. No one was forcing him. No one could force him. Jesus did it voluntarily of his own free will for you and for me. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. The command I have received from my Father. Therefore, there was a division among the Jews because of those sayings. So misunderstood. Therefore, everywhere you go, they were misunderstanding what he was saying. Now, Wednesday's lesson, it kind of zeroes into the the, the heart of the crucible, the crucified God. On the cross, friends, and you've heard me say this before, on the cross, Jesus bled from seven, seven parts of his anatomy. He was the perfect sacrifice. Jesus bled from his two feet in atonement for our wrong and crooked paths. Jesus bled from his two hands in atonement for the acts of injustice, the acts of horror that we commit. Jesus bled from his lacerated and open back in atonement for the burden of sin that we all carry. Jesus bled from his, his scarred head in atonement for the impure and, and evil thoughts that we all think. And Jesus bled from his open heart in atonement for the false loves that we all nurture. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. A great commotion accompanied accompanied his death. In a microcosmic way, the end of the world was exemplified and illustrated on Calvary that day. According to him in his eschatological sermon in Matthew 24, the earth quaked in sympathy with its dying author. All of humanity was reunited to the right and to the left of the cross, which was Christ's throne, personified by the two thieves, the lost and the saved. The shades of the sun were lowered. When Jesus was born, there was light at midnight. But when he died, there was darkness at midday. The end of the world was typified at Calvary. At the heart of the cross, we find forgiveness provided. The answer to the demands of sin. We find God is our substitute. What did the cross achieve? the salvation of sinners, the revelation of God, the triumph over evil. And what does it mean to live under this throne, the cross? Communion and celebration. It means self-understanding and surrender. It means love towards our enemies. It means suffering and glory. And it will be the anthem and the subject throughout eternity. You know, in the context of the trials of the Christian journey, we have to remember a few things. And this is where it applies to you and to me. What does Christ's crucible or Christ in the crucible, what does that mean for you and for me? And this is where we have to remember a few things. First of all, Christ Christ faced infinitely more pain than we could ever fathom. And he gave us an example of steadiness, of resistance, of resilience, and of perseverance. So like I said in the beginning, we're not following a leader that leads from behind. God wasn't happy, he wasn't content, he wasn't satisfied in just staying up in heaven, in the throne, surrounded by angels, shouting out and telling us what to do in a loud voice. He came down. He stepped on the thorns. He cut away the brushes and the the bushes. He trailed that path. He crushed the thorns so that you could walk on them. He opened the way. So friends, at the throne of the universe, at the center of the universe, we have a God that perfectly understands what you go through. We have at the center of this universe a God that knows what it's like to lose a child. He knows what it means to give all and receive nothing. 
He knows what loss is. He knows what grief is. He knows what temptation is. He knows what hunger is. He knows what sadness is. He knows what betrayal is. All of these things that you feel, all of these crucibles that you go through, he knows what that is. So the things that he tells you in the Bible, it's not a a loud bark. It's not coming from someone who talks the talk but didn't walk the walk. More than anyone, he walked the walk. Even in this, Jesus Jesus is better. Even in being a human, he knows more. This is the God that we serve. This is the God that is intimately interested in returning and coming back soon. He trailed the path before us. He more than anyone knows every step of the way. And secondly, that was the first thing that we have to remember. The second thing that we have to remember, when we suffer, we need to remember the results of the trials of Jesus. He became the wound healer and he became the heart mender. Because he went through those things, he can heal you. He can work with you. That's, the, that's one of the things that, that, that speaks to me the most when I contemplate the, the, the disciples. Look at those men. Look at those people. Look at the people that Jesus surrounded himself with. And again, I've said this a few times before. There's Peter. Peter always had his foot in his mouth, acted before he thought. Serious, serious ego problems. I would say that Peter was in one way or another bipolar always either too high or too low. Any R, you know, HR department in any big company would have sent him packing the first week. And then you have, in the middle of that group, you have Matthew, a tax collector, and you have a zealot. Do you know what that... You know, forget them, you know, uh, uh, Republicans and Democrats. Forget the division that we see in our, our country right now. These were people that were ready to kill each other. The zealots literally killed other you know, Jewish people and parties and Romans and, you know, that disagreed with them. And so you're getting a zealot and you're getting a tax collector, a publican, and putting them in the same group. It's like mixing fire and and gasoline. So the entire group is dysfunctional. You have these men that are constantly bickering and arguing and fighting. And again, that just goes to show that, look, if God could use these men, if God could work through them, if he could change them, if he could make them what they became, do you really think that he can't use you too? Do you really think that he can't work through you and shine through you and change lives through you? Because we're tempted constantly to think, well, what, what do I bring to the table? What can I offer? That's a diversion. That's an illusion. Do you really think that God has really helped or his ministry and his work is enhanced by your great gifts? (laughs) Do you think that he's really bothered by your, your, your disabilities and your lack of whatever you think your gifts aren't? Friends, God doesn't, he's not enhanced by your abilities and he's not hindered by your disabilities. He wants your availability. He wants you to be there, to be ready, to be willing. The Bible tells us that through his his stripes, we are healed. And that becomes a lifestyle that we so need in today's world. He suffered in our stead. His wounds and scars heal us. And at the same time, by his grace, we can become instruments of omnipotence in his hands, healing others, a world that is in a crucible. It's not just you. We're all in, you know, it's... Everyone, the people around you, the, the people at the gas station, the people in the grocery store, the people that you see on the street, you know, we ha- humans are really good at uh, demonizing other people. Humans are really good at seeing others as enemies. Us on this side, them on that side. We're really good at seeing differences. And the sad thing is that humans are scared by what they don't know, scared of the unknown. We need to see everyone through the eyes of God. Because he loves them every single, through the eyes of God, every man, every woman, every child is a prince, a princess, 
an heir of heaven, of eternity. And we need to learn to see them that way. And they're going through their own crucible. Jesus came and he met us where, he was, where we were at. He came to a well in Samaria and met that woman where she was at. In the midst of her cynicism, in the midst of her irony, of her defense mechanisms, he met Matthew where he was at. He met the demoniac of Gadara where he was at. And God will meet you where you are at as well. And friends, the good news is that one day, very soon, the hosts of heaven will gather around the great white throne of the universe. And they will be dressed for war. For the last day will have come. On earth, the four winds will have been let go to proclaim that the days, the Lord's day of judgment has arrived. The universe will stand to see the final battle, to witness the final battle. Light defeating darkness. Christ, our Lamb, the Prince of Peace, will have clad Michael's armor. And he will return. He will return. This time not as a suffering servant anymore, but this time as the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the God of of the universe, and he will come back for you and for me. And finally, this nightmare will be over. Don't elude yourself, friend. This world is ending very soon. They say that 70% of Americans believe that in the next 10 years there will be civil war. Observe the nations. Aren't they as chaotic waters being tossed around? Does that sound familiar? Wars and rumors of wars, natural disasters, fires, earthquakes, tsunamis, floods. Does that sound familiar? Pestilences, does that sound familiar? Crisis in the religious world. Does that sound familiar? Jesus is coming. But you know what is even more familiar? The message is being preached. The gospel is being set out to the world. And so Jesus will come soon again. Do not let the crucibles of this life take away from your heart the hope that we have that soon and very soon we are going to see the king. May God bless you. Study the cross. Study Calvary. And I'm sure that that will uplift your heart every day. Which is why I do invite you to take advantage of this free offer, of this little booklet. It's a beautiful booklet. This one I've paged through. It's beautiful. And it goes through the high cost of the cross. You could call 866-788-3966. You could ask for offer number 156. If you're in the U.S., you can text SH080 to the number 40544. If you're outside of continental North America, go to study.aftv.org slash sh 080, and you get a digital download of this, which will enhance your understanding, your study, your contemplation of the cross. I'd like to invite you to bow your head for us to pray. Dear Lord God, thank you so much. That's all I can say. Thank you so much. Um, You have done so many things for us. You have taught us so many things. Lord, the story of the cross, the story of Calvary, the story of the life of Christ inspires us to be better, inspires us to be more like Jesus. Lord, sometimes we get carried away with the things here of this world and we get distracted and we get um, discouraged because of everything that happens around us. But Lord, allow us to take our eyes off our problems and face, and, 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 and face you, place our eyes on you who can solve all the problems. Help us have the right perspective, Lord, and help us put into practice what it means to have the eyes of Christ, the eyes that see other people as sinners just like us in need of a Savior, in need of forgiveness, in need of love and acceptance, and allow us to live that life. Bless this church, the local congregation, and those that are far away watching online. Be with them as well, Lord. I ask you these things in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. May God bless you.